Are y'all ready to worship this morning? In the first service, they were still trying to wake up just a little bit, but I feel like y'all have like, had some more time to get some coffee going and now you're ready to worship. Let's put our hands together. Take a seat real quick. I've got a few announcements I want to share with you. Uh, I want to start by telling you that today begins our actual guest for stewardship. You know, at Jan in January here at Central, it's stewardship month, time when we have an emphasis on what it means to be stewards of everything that God has given to us. And so today you're going to be blessed to hear from a missionary. He and his family are on their way to the Dominican Republic. They've been there as uh, interns serving with some other folks, and they've been back now for about two years establishing their support to go and do the work themselves because God has called them to specific areas. So I won't say a whole lot about it because I'm going to introduce them to you in just a little bit when he comes to speak and share his uh, video and uh, preach to you. And then also next Sunday, 
we're going to have the uh, Kennedys, Tate Kennedy, who is on his way to the Czech Republic. So next week you'll hear from him. And in the week after that, you're going to hear from Mike Knapper, who has been serving for several years now over in Burkina Faso, uh, Africa, and has a great, great work. So I know that each one will touch your hearts. I know that each one will inspire you and be a blessing in your life. Also, I want to tell you that at the end of this month, January 30th, Sunday afternoon, January 30th, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're going to hold another Discover Central. What is Discover Central? If you've been attending Central for a while and uh, maybe just, you know, joined but haven't really gone to a Discover Central time, we would love for you to come. Uh, last time we did this in, I think it was in October, we had about 70 people come. But we would love for you to come and find out more about the fellowship here at Central and what our vision is, what our mission is, and how coming together as a church family, we're, we feel we are equipped uh, and able to accomplish all that God's given us to do. So we'll feed you dinner, and we'll have, you know, pastor will talk a little bit, Tim will talk, I'll talk. We just want to share with you some great things that God is doing here. So it be a great time to get to know us and for us to get to know you. Also, on the first Sunday in February, we're going to have All Ties Sunday. What is that? That's when we ask everybody to be obedient to the Word of God in the tithe, and we see what happens when everyone comes together and tithe to the Lord and how God provides through that. And on that Sunday, we're going to have Dr. Johnny Hunt, one of my favorites. He'll be here preaching for us on that day, so I want you to make sure and make plans and clear your... Don't go snow skiing that weekend. Don't go fishing that weekend. Hey, don't go camping that weekend. You come to the house of God, make sure you're here. It's going to be a great, great day. Because here's what else. On that day, at the end of service, we will have had all of our missionaries here. And you know, every time this church is so good at loving on missionaries. Every time we have missionaries here, we allow them to share uh, great needs that they have in order to get the work done where they're serving. And this church is so faithful to give. So on that Sunday, February 6th, we're going to have a love offering for all of our missionaries. So today you're going to get to hear a great need. Next week, you'll get to hear a great need, the week after that. And then on Sunday, February the 6th, we're going to give a love offering uh, to pour our love out on these missionaries and enable, enabling them to go and get the things that they need for their great work. So thank you so much, church, for your faithfulness and giving. Amen? Um, give God praise that he enables you to give this morning. Aren't you thankful for that? Thank you so much. For your faithfulness and giving it's because of our collective faithfulness and giving that we are able to do all the things that we do all the ministry that we do here at central but not only here supporting missionaries all over the world uh, supporting bible colleges supporting uh, organizations that go out and plant churches here in the united states so when you give here and you give an offering it's not just for here it affects world missions it affects uh, missions within the united states so God uses it greatly, and we thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. Um, also, um, if you are a guest today, we ask you to do us a favor. There's a connect card in the seat front, right in back in front of you, seat back in front of you. Him normally does this. I've been out of this for a while, so I've kind of lost my lingo. If you would take one of these cards, do us a favor, at the end of service today, fill it out, and then walk out into our lobby. There will be a table out there by the water fountain called our connect table. I believe Brother Art's going to be out there at the end, um, or somebody will, because we're, we're going to talk about some other tables in just a second. But they'll be out there, and if you'll take that card to them, give it to them. We've got a gift bag we want to give you. Our way of saying thank you for coming to worship with us today. Just a few goodies and some information in there. All right, those other tables. Today is our Life Group Expo. So there's tables out here in the main lobby, and there are tables in the hall that connects the main worship center to our children's center. So please, we are asking you to go by and visit those tables. Some groups are already full. And you say, why would a group be full? Well, because they're meeting in houses. And, you know, I would love to have you all over to my house, but you won't all fit. We would have people standing on the outside. And so we don't want that. We want everyone to come inside. So we've got about 12 groups started. One of the groups meets on uh, Saturdays, and that's a group especially for widowed ladies. And so if maybe that would connect with you and you could find some good shepherding and good instruction and wisdom in that group, we would invite you to sign up for that group. We also have two groups that meet at Denny's on Fry Road on Wednesday morning. Some people are like, yeah, I like food. You got my attention. So you could go to those groups. They meet at 615. So if you're an early bird, Brittany's laughing. Count me out. Yeah. 
Wednesday mornings at 6.15, there's two groups that meet at Denny's. There's lots of room. You can join those groups. There's a men's group and a women's group at the Denny's on Wednesday mornings. We also have a group that's going to be meeting on Tuesday evenings, and we've got several that are meeting on Sunday afternoons. So get signed up today because a lot of groups are starting this evening. Some will be starting Tuesday. You can join the Wednesday group or the uh, widows group on Saturday. So we just want you to get connected with a group because as we disciple each other, iron sharpens iron, and we'll all grow in our relationship with God. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure and stop by. Don't forget, there's tables in the hall connecting the two buildings. There's tables out here in the lobby. We would love for you to get plugged in and signed up to a group today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this service. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here today. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you and praise you, God, for everything that you've given to us. We ask, Lord, now that you would be with us as we continue in our worship. And I pray, God, that you would uh, be with Brother Lane as he comes to speak in just a few moments and ask your blessings on the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand again. And your name, the mountain shake and crumble.
mentioned a moment ago, we have very special guests today. Um, so, you know, we all know Josh Lane over here, right? Wave everybody. Wave to Josh, right? We know who Josh is. This was very interesting when we booked this couple to come. And uh, their name, his name is Josh Lane. Spelt the exact same way. And so we are blessed today. They're not the same people. Some people, when I said Josh Lane will be speaking, they were like, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> we don't ever hear Josh say more than five words in a row. Well, he can talk. But trust me, this Josh will talk. Amen. <laughs> Brother Josh, uh, he and his wife, Tia, and their kid, precious children, we had the opportunity last night to have dinner with them, and boy, let me tell you, this family is precious. This is our first time to have them with us, and so we are excited uh, about the opportunity that we have as a church to partner with them and their ministry in the Dominican Republic. If you're happy that they're here today, give them a good warm welcome as they make their way up. My name is Josh Lane. We're in good company, amen? <laughs> this, this is my wife, Tia, and this is our oldest son, Ezra, our daughter, Marilyn, and our youngest son, Jubal. And we are church planning missionaries to the country of the Dominican Republic. And I just want to uh, say uh, this morning publicly that I am thankful for this lady right here. Uh, she is, I, I'm the missionary that I can be because she's behind me, amen? amen? And the Lord called her to the mission field before we were ever engaged. She's as much called to the mission field as I am. And so uh, I just want to, the Bible says men were supposed to raise up and praise our wives. Amen. That means that we're supposed to give credit where credit's due. And the Lord, the Lord gave me a good thing. Amen. And so I just wanted to introduce them to you all. And uh, now we'll let them get to class because I know they're. Thank you all for welcoming. I know they're dying to get to class. <laughs> I encourage you to stop by the table out, out back here in the in the foyer or the lobby or whatever it is that we call it nowadays and grab a prayer card amen on the back of that prayer card there is a spot for prayer requests amen and i got you a pen also so you can fill it out and then for those of you the prayer cards aren't your thing pens aren't your things i got bracelets too we got our website on them you can go to our website you can learn everything about us uh there we have video and all that uh, thing there so i invite you to stop by there uh, and, and pick you up one of those. And when I, when I ask you to pray for us, I do that with all of my being. I go places and I see things that I cannot even verbally communicate to you this morning. I have been in life-threatening situations uh, where I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that somebody somewhere was praying for me. And then I go home and check my email, and I've got a little blip in my email. Hey, Brother Lane, just want to let you know I was praying for you this morning. Listen, prayer can go anywhere that God can go. Prayer can do anything that God can do. Now, our brother Ian Bounds said that. Now, don't go to seed on it, okay? You think about it a little bit, and it might start twisting your melon. But when you talk to God, He is everywhere at all times. He knows all things. And he's able to make all grace abound towards you and I. Hey Josh, how do you know that's true? Well, in 2012, I started asking God, where am I supposed to serve you? I had graduated Bible college. I knew where I was supposed to go. I knew what I was supposed to, or excuse me, I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to preach the word, amen? But I didn't know where. And here I am in Springfield, Missouri. I mean, the middle, you don't get any more middle of the country than Springfield, Missouri. I mean, you're as far from a beach as you can get, Right? And there was ads for the Dominican Republic everywhere. Radio, billboard, television. I was meeting Dominicans. I'm like, what in the world is going on? It was everywhere. I started asking God, what am I supposed to do with this? Is it supposed to be the Dominican Republic? And at that time, Tia was five hours north at Truman State University. When I say that she is the brains of the outfit, she had a full-ride scholarship to Truman State University for mathematics. And... I will listen to her when she speaks, but I don't get it all. Amen? So, but anyway, she was there, five hours away. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to lay my fleece out, if you will. Uh, if the Dominican Republic is where you want me to go, and Tia Cunningham is the woman I'm supposed to marry, then I'm just going to sit and wait and be still and let you confirm that through her. I didn't tell anybody. 
That was a silent prayer in my heart between me and God. Two months later, I get a phone call. It was after church, young people. Okay? Because we're spiritual. Amen? It was after church. And she was crying. Because the only thing that we had ever talked about missions was we were both adamant that was not what we were going to do. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? And she said, I don't know how you're going to take this, but I really believe that God's calling me to the country of the Dominican Republic. Whew. And even right now, standing right here before you, I feel like I'm going to burn up from the inside out. That is your God. He hears you when you talk to him. When you talk to him on behalf of all of the missionaries that you support, he hears you. And he wants to hear you. It's not necessarily an, oblig an, an, an obligatory hearing. He's not obligated to hear us. We're sinners. Amen? Yeah. He saved us because of His grace, because of His love. He saved us, and He hears us, but He wants to hear us. So pray for your missionaries. I can't encourage you enough to pray for your missionaries. As you watch the video, uh, just remember uh, that... There's faces like this in every mission field that you support. And those missionaries that are serving and those people who get saved, they're an extension of your ministry. These are the faces of your ministry. They say God is everywhere, but he sleeps in Harabakoa. In this valley of just over 90,000 people that sits below the famous hammock of God, he is definitely not sleeping. We are the Lane family, church planning missionaries to the Dominican Republic, and we believe God has called us to Harabakoa. Over the last two years, we have witnessed the Holy Spirit working all over the island. Along with missionaries Wesley and Melina Lane, we relaunched the church now known as Iglesia Bautista Agua Viva in Harabakoa. In the year and a half that has followed, we have seen God working mightily for His namesake. Through the local church in Harabakoa, the youth camp that serves local churches and other missionaries in the Dominican Republic, as well as a 10-day evangelistic outreach into Haiti, we have seen God miraculously save 89 precious souls. While this is wonderful news, the reality is that there are 10.5 million people on the island, 95% of which actively engage in idol worship on a daily basis. The Bible is clear that all those who reject Christ are on their way to an eternal hell. The Dominican Republic is a country rich in history and a culture all its own. From the colonial district of the first settlement in the New World to many waterfalls, to its beautiful beaches and all the delicious food a person can eat, a person on vacation could find beauty in any place they look in the Dominican Republic. But when you look closer, the truth begins to take shape. Drugs, teen pregnancy, child molestation, and suicide are prevalent everywhere you look. Poverty, hunger, and a high unemployment rate add to the daily frustration of these precious people. They are looking for an answer. They are looking for hope. The good news is, there is hope. His name is Jesus Christ. In the Dominican Republic, they say God knows everything. God knew and put a plan in place. His plan is redemption through His Son. His plan is the local church. Through evangelism, obedience to the Lord and believers' baptism, and active ongoing discipleship, we are seeing lives changed. To those of you who have prayed and financially supported us over the last two to four years, we want to say a huge thank you. Words cannot express our gratitude for your hearts towards the Dominican people. These are the faces of your ministry. These are the faces of the lives your prayers and gifts have impacted for eternity.
In the Dominican Republic, they say God is in control of everything, and we believe He is indeed. If the Lord wills, we endeavor to return as soon as possible to continue the work in Harbacoa, as well as pursue several ministry opportunities that are waiting. We are currently looking to buy 1,000 square meters of land for the Haitian congregation in Harbacoa as they have outgrown our current building. In the growing town of Boca Chica, we have land as well as a trained national who is ready to work. We are excited to get him in his own building that will no doubt be full quickly after it is finished. We will also continue to help grow Iglesia Bautista Agua Viva to the point that it can be independent. We are excited to return to the work God has for us. Would you please prayerfully consider supporting the Lord's ministry in the Dominican Republic? They are waiting to hear, and we are willing to go. You can give people water, and you should. You can give people food, and you should. You can give them clothing, housing, you name it, and you should, church. But if you have not given them Jesus, you have not given them anything. Everything that we do, I believe, I am a firm believer in this, I am a church planning missionary, it should happen and be facilitated by the local church. That's why I plant churches. I believe that, that everything that happens good in the community happens because there is a Bible-believing church there full of active believers. Because without us and the, and, the, and, and, and the spirit that indwells us, amen, they don't have any answers. None. So if you have not given somebody Jesus, you have not given them anything. Give them Jesus first and then give them the rest of it. Amen? And that's what we teach our people in the Dominican Republic. As soon as they get saved, we teach them, this is how you are supposed to act now. This is what you're supposed to do now. I remember one time we, we got 900 chick tracks in the mail in the Dominican Republic. If you don't know what a chick track is, it's like a little tiny comic book that presents the gospel. And, and that comic book, uh, they love those things in the Dominican Republic. I mean, they just eat them up. And I told them, I said, it, I told our teenagers, I said, if you can hand all these out in two hours, we'll go to the pizza hut. Some of y'all will get that at lunch. And, and in an hour and a half, these are brand new baby believers. The only thing they know is that Jesus loves them. That's all they know. And in an hour and a half, they had handed out every one of those tracks. Listen, they didn't put them in doors, okay? They gave them into people's hands. Now, that's a lot easier to do there than here. I will definitely concede that. I was listening to the brother's story this morning about knocking on the door without an appointment. Whew. But in the Dominican Republic, mi casa es su casa. My house is your house. That is how they live. And 4 o'clock in the afternoon, all the doors open. Listen, the door to present the gospel in the Dominican Republic is wide open. I can literally walk into somebody's house and sit down. It is culturally expected for me to do that, and I can give them the gospel. They might not like it, but they can't unhear it. Amen? And those teenagers, those brand new baby believers, they gave out tracks, 900 of them in an hour and a half. And then we went to the pizza hut, insert laugh, no. <laughs> And we, I mean, we just had a big time there. And I wanted them to understand that when we do what we're supposed to do as Christians, there is a reward, right? When you do what you can for Jesus, he will reward you. Because of who he is, right? Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who he is. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. This is probably, uh, hands down, one of my most favorite portions of Scripture uh, in all the Bible. Mark chapter 14 and verse 1, the Scripture says this, After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. 
And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, him being Jesus, there was a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Can I just stop right there real quick? I just want to say this. You're either a murmurer or a missionary. You can't be both. If you're constantly murmuring against God and His people and His plan, you can't be a missionary. What do you want to be known for? Verse 6, And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Thank you for who you are, Lord. We know that you alone are worthy. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that we can come before you and talk to you. And you listen to us, Lord. Thank you. Lord, as we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, I ask that you would please uh, instruct us through the preaching of your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to take and apply the things that we hear and understand so that we may live them out before a lost and dying world. In Jesus' holy name, amen. She hath done what she could. This, this is the question I want to ask you this morning. Are you doing what you can? Now, don't confuse what you can't do with what you won't do. We do that a lot. We can't do that, pastor. We can't do that, missionary. I can't do that, dad. I can't do that, mom. And what we're actually saying is this. I won't do that. That's what we're actually saying. As it relates to missions in Philippians chapter 4, you know that phrase, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me? It like sells coffee cups by the millions every year, t-shirts, you name it. Do you know what that phrase, in the context in which it was spoken, it was talking about missions. Church planting, that's what it was talking about. The church at Philippi was financially supporting Paul to plant churches. And Paul said, you can, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So don't confuse what you can't do, which in Christ is nothing, with what you won't do. The Bible says, she hath done what she could. Now doing what you can is often uncomfortable. Look here in verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper... Think about that. You guys want to go to a leper's house with me? How many people want to go hang out with a leper? It's a very nasty, deadly, stinky disease. Your body parts literally rot off. That's not comfortable. And she walked into this guy's house. Right Now, if you cross-reference this portion of Scripture with the other Gospels, you find out that Simon the leper was also a Pharisee, which explains why he has a house instead of living in the leper colony. So not only did she go into the leper's house, she went into a Pharisee's house, a woman with this type of reputation, just like you sang about this morning. Think about that. You think she was comfortable? Absolutely not. But she went anyway. Listen, it's not comfortable to uproot your whole family and take them to another country and learn a new language and learn a new culture and learn that the water isn't even safe to rinse your own toothbrush in and learn that the plumbing isn't up to United States standards and so you have all kinds of issues which we won't go into. There's nothing comfortable about that. No AC, mosquitoes everywhere, dengue fever, malaria, yellow fever, you name it, tuberculosis. It's not comfortable. But what can you do for Jesus? What can you do? The second thing I want you to see is not only was 
it uncomfortable, but it was also inconvenient. Look at verse 3. So they're in the house of Simon the leper as he sat at meat. Now we're Baptists, amen? At Hillside Baptist Church, my sending church, we say this. We meet, we eat. And we have a church bird, right? Called a chicken. And we fry that thing, right? They were sitting at meat. And listen, you had better not, you had better not interrupt a good buffet line in a Baptist church. You'll start a riot, right? Amen. It wasn't convenient, was it? She could have said, no, 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 I can't do that. It's in the house of a leper. He's also a Pharisee. And they're eating dinner. This is definitely not the time to do this. But I want you to see the second statement in verse 8. Verse 8, Jesus said this, She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the berry. It was inconvenient, but it was timely. Do you understand? Jesus was getting ready to die for you and I. And he said, She has come to anoint my body for the berry. You find out from the other passages when you cross reference that she broke it over his head, but it went all the way to his feet. And she washed his feet with her own tears, dried them with her hair. If she had not done this, church, who would have? I ask myself that question when I read this portion of Scripture. If she had not done it, who would have? Now, thank the Lord that she did it. Amen? But here's what I want to ask you this morning. What is it that God is asking you to do that is uncomfortable, that is inconvenient, but the time is right, and still you disobey? What is it? Maybe he's asking you to be a missionary. And you're sitting there saying, I can't do that. Can't or won't. Maybe he's asking you to up your giving this year. I don't know. That's between you and him. And you're saying, I can't do that. Can't or won't. Maybe he's asking you to go in the nursery and take care of the little babies so the moms can sit in here and catch an hour reprieve. You're saying, no, I can't do that. Can't or won't. See, if we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us, and we love the bumper sticker, we love the shirt, we like the cup full of coffee, amen, black because I'm American, no. We like that verse. We love that verse until it's time to put it into action. And then we're like, no, 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 I can't do that. Can't, won't. She had this reputation. She hath done what she could. And look at what Jesus says about her in verse 9. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. If you do what you can for the Lord, He will reward you. But don't do it for that. Listen, that lady was not thinking about when she went in there and she was solely, wholly focused on her Savior, on her Creator, on her King. She was totally focused on Him and she broke that box in that moment of private worship held publicly, she could have cared less that 2,000 years later we're talking about her. Don't do it for the reward because you have your reward. But understand that when you do what you can, Jesus honors that. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. And the third thing I want you to see this morning is it costs costs. And this is where Jesus loses a lot of servants. Verse 4, And there were some that had indignation within themselves, 
Why was this waste? And said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Now, if you cross-reference the other Gospels, you understand that the people who had indignation within themselves was Judas Iscariot and his father, Simon the leper. Those are the people that had indignation. And you also understand when you cross-reference those Gospels, and I challenge you to do that, okay? Get into God's Word and, and dig out the details. Because these were real people with real stories just like you and I, and they lived lives just like you and I. Listen, Jesus wasn't having dinner with these people and they were total strangers. He knew exactly who they were. But Judas had indignation within himself and he carried the purse. Why do you think Jesus said, listen, you have the poor with you always and you can help them whenever you want. Why? Because you carry the purse. But instead he got all pious and self-righteous and pharisaical. Kind of ironic that his dad was a Pharisee. And said, this could have been sold for 300 pence. 300 pence would have been a year's salary for this lady. You ever done that? I can honestly say I haven't. But pass the offering plate and you go, here you go, Jesus. Here's a year's salary. Man. That's what she did. And they despised her for it. They were indignant against her. Listen to me, church. I beg you, understand that they will despise you. They will hate you. But take comfort in that. Because that means you're on the right track. If they love you, that means there's something wrong between you and Jesus. Bottom line. If all of your unsaved ungodly, worldly friends love you, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because that means there is something wrong between you and your Creator. There is something wrong between you and your Savior. There is something wrong between you and your King. And you better figure out what it is. Because they hate Him. And by default, they will hate you. But take joy in that. Take joy in that. 300 pence a year's salary. Say, so Josh, what does all this have to do with missions and, and, and stewardship and all of this stuff? Well, it is uncomfortable, inconvenient, and it costs everything that you have and everything that you are to do missions. I know. I am a missionary. I don't say these things lightly. I don't say these things uh, uh, just for the sake of beating the air with words, just for the sake of having a sermon. I want you to understand, when you follow Jesus, it is not just a free ticket to heaven. When you follow Jesus, it will cost you. But the price is worth it. Because one day, everything that you see here is going to fall away. It's going to be you and him, if you know him. And you're going to be looking at him in his very eyes. You are going to see his body that was marred and beaten and broken for you. I'm a firm believer. Listen, they touched his scars in his hands, and his feet. Thomas put his hand in his side. You think those are the only scars that Jesus kept? I think he's got every one of them. And I think we're going to see them when we look at him face to face. And are you going to be able to say to him, I did what I could? Or is he going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you have to get this right first. You have to believe the gospel. You have to believe that he was made flesh and dwelt among us. You understand that Jesus was the first missionary? I love Philippians chapter 2 because it tells us the story of Jesus' mission. He left the riches of eternal glory. He left 
the presence of the Father. And he stepped down to you and I, to our level, to die for us. He was made flesh. And he took on himself the form of a servant. And he was humble and obedient, even unto death. You imagine he, him saying, listen, I can't do that. They're sinners. I can't do that. I created them. They fell. They left. I'm not doing that. I can't do that. Imagine if that had been his attitude. Thankfully, God is love. And he died for you and I. He was made sin. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians that he was made to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not only was he made flesh, but he was made to be your sin. His very identity became your sin and my sin. Yes, he paid the price. Yes, he bore the sin. But that's who he became on the cross. You think God the Father turned his back for no reason? He was made sin so that you and I could be made righteous. And he allowed all that sin to come to fruition and finish in his body. And he died for you and I. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what, church? Death. He did that for you. You say, Josh, I thought Jesus was, 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 wasn't, wasn't made. I thought that he w has been for, from eternity past to eternity present and into eternity future. That is true. If you understand what the made means in that passage, it is exactly where we get our English word for poem. I love poetry. I write poetry to my wife. But we use words that already exist, don't we? And we form them into beautiful sentences and rhymes. And we give them as gifts. Hallmark makes billions of dollars a year with poetry. This is what God the Father did. He took His only begotten Son who already existed and He made Him more beautiful for you and I. Hebrews chapter 5, not only was He made flesh, not only was He made to be sin, but He was made to be perfect. Once again, because he is all powerful and he conquered death and he conquered sin and he conquered hell and he conquered the grave. And he, because of his obedience, became the author of eternal salvation for you and I. And all you have to do is confess your sin and believe it. That's it. And then, after you have that settled, do what you can. Do what you can. And do you know what that is? Open your mouth and tell others. Because you can't take your house, can't take a car, can't take money, can't take this beautiful building. None of that's going with you. You know what's going with you? Souls. That's what's going with you. And I sit sometimes and I get heartbroken because I think to myself, how many people who sit in the pew week after week are going to stand before God empty-handed one day when they could go with their hands full? One day we're all going to be around the throne of God. We know that from Revelation chapter 5. And we're going to be singing the gospel. It says they sang a new song. He is worthy he hath redeemed us to God by the blood. We're going to be singing that. And there's going to be Dominicans. And there's going to be Haitians. And there's going to be Puerto Ricans. And there's going to be Texans. And there's going to be Americans. Yes, I separate the two. And we're all going to be worshiping Him. Are you going to be there empty-handed? Or are you going to have this testimony? I did what I could. Don't confuse what you can't do with what you won't do. And leave her alone because she did what she could. Amen.
May I ask you if you would just bow your heads together for a moment. Whether you're here in the building or watching online. We never at this church like the gospel to go out without giving people opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit of God. And so I would just ask you this question. First of all, have you come to the place in your life where you have given Jesus Christ your life? Because that is the starting place. That's where you begin. It begins with you acknowledging that you've sinned against a righteous and holy God and you need the forgiveness that is made available to you through His Son, Jesus Christ. And you can make that decision right now where you're seated. Right now, if you're watching from home, you can make that decision right now wherever you're at. Say, well, I don't know a whole lot about the Bible. I don't know a whole lot about Jesus. You never find those requirements in God's Word to come to Him for forgiveness. Simple, simple statement. It says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So what are you to believe? You're to believe that Jesus Christ, first of all, is the Son of God, that He came to this earth, that He was sinless, and that He went to the cross and He died for your sins, because He had no sins to die for, like Brother Josh just said, he became sin. He became our sin. He became my sin. He became your sin. And then God the Father punished him in our place so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. So is all you need to know is that he loves you and that he gave his life for you. And the question is, are you willing to come to him this morning and say, I give my life to you? I want to live the rest of my life for you. If you would do that this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'll pray for you. I'm not going to come to you after church and make you say anything to me or to anyone else, but I do want to pray for you. If you'd say, you know what, I, I'm not sure if I've ever done that, but I do want you to pray for me that I would have the boldness, the confidence, the humility necessary to just admit my sin to God. Pastor, would you pray for me? If that's you this morning, wherever... You're at in this building. Would you slip your hand up real quick and write back down so I can pray for you? Is there anybody that would say that this morning? Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what? I've, I've received Jesus. I am a Christian. But when he asks that question, am I doing all that I can? Jesus said about the woman, she did what she could. Are we doing what we could? I like the way he put that. We say we can't when really it's just we won't. Have we been telling the Lord no just because we don't want to? Because I believe there's people sitting in this room this morning that God's been calling you to do something. Maybe it's to go to a foreign field. It might just be to walk across the street to your lost neighbor. It might be to speak to the person sitting on the couch next to you in your own home. But whatever it is, you know you haven't been doing it. So the question to you today is this. Will you say yes to Jesus today about whatever it is he's been telling you to do? If you need prayer for that, you're not alone. Just if you'd be honest before God and say, you know, there's something he's been telling me to do and I need I need to step up. Would you just lift your hand this morning before God? Is there anyone that would say that? Hands all over this room. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to come to you in prayer. And Lord, I want to lift up the couple hands that went up saying, I'm not sure that I've ever made the decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Maybe there were people at home watching online, Lord, who raised their hand to you in regards to that. I pray, Lord, right now in the quietness of this moment, that all those who acknowledge their need to receive Jesus that would just pray right now to you and ask you, Lord, to forgive them and invite you into their life. And Lord, for all those others that raised their hand or maybe didn't raise their hand but sure thought, you know, I haven't been doing all that I can. And a lot of times I use the excuse that I can't, but really the situation is I just won't. I pray, Lord, for those who want to say yes to you today, that you'd fill their heart, Lord, with 
with confidence and joy in saying yes to you because God, your plan for each of us is perfect. And many of us are missing the joy that you have for us because we've been living life our way instead of your way. So right now, Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. He's going to sing. This altar's open. The invitation is simple. Would you just come and talk to God this morning? Let's start this stewardship right. Let's start by saying, God, I want to say yes to you. Will you come as we sing and as we pray right now? People are coming. If the Lord's spoken to you, don't say no right now. Say yes and come talk to him. Thank you for coming. There's people coming, people praying. the world will convince you. In fact, a lot of times the devil will even let you think or let you hang on to the truth and the reality that you need Jesus, but he'll try to convince you that you need a lot of other things as well. The song we were just singing, He's All I Need, it's one of the greatest truths you'll ever discover. I'm going to say that one more time. That is not one of, it is the greatest truth you will ever discover that Jesus Christ is all that you need. The world tells us, well, you need some material things and you need a right job, you need the perfect mate, which, you know, I'm thankful I found that. If you know her, you're like, amen. But what happened for her, I don't know. But, you know, I'm thankful I was on the blessed side of that one. But the truth is, guys, Jesus is all we need, amen. He's so good to us and we thank him praise him for his goodness. Brother Josh, did y'all enjoy him this morning? Praise God. Come on up. You know, every week while our missionaries are here, you're going to hear what their greatest need is. So we've invited him to come and share his, what their greatest need when they get back to the field is because we at, on Sunday, February the 6th, are going to receive an offering and you're going to have opportunity to either designate to one missionary or just give an offering and it'll be split up between the missionaries and their needs. But Brother Josh, share with them your need today. So right now we're looking to buy a new church van. Uh, we have, a, right now we use a one ton Ford van, 15 passenger, uh, it's 1999. It spends more time in the shop now than it does on the road. And uh, we use that van pretty much every day. A lot of the kids that you saw, they walk to church uh, and they do that despite their parents. Amen, they want to worship. And we have some, they'll run 30 minutes to get to church. Uh, and so a church van, so transportation is something that we take for granted here. Uh, in the states, but it would be a huge blessing to them, and we're trying to raise about twenty thousand dollars for twenty thousand dollars for a van. Yes, sir. So, you be in prayer between now and that Sunday, how the Lord would enable you and allow you. Remember, don't say you can't, because the truth is, we can all do something. Say amen. 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 All right. What a joy it's been to have Josh and his wife Tia with us. They're going to be at their mission table back there, and don't forget, we have all of our. Uh, life group tables and don't forget there are tables in the uh, glass hall area between the church and the children's center we would love for you to get signed up and connected into a life group today so please visit those tables if you're our guest stop by our connect table we have a gift bag 
we'd love to give you and, and like the opportunity to meet you. God bless you all, and uh, have a wonderful week.